Okay, welcome back. And today we're going to talk about a specific uh, discrete probability distribution called the binomial distribution. Okay, so how do we know if a random variable has a binomial distribution? This is where we're going to start looking at conditions. And if if a random variable in a an experiment, so in a probability experiment, if the probability experiment satisfies certain conditions and the random variable is defined a certain way, we can categorize it as a certain distribution. And the first distribution that we're going to talk about is the binomial distribution. Now the binomial distribution gets, it, gets its name from the fact that we're going to deal with a particular type of trial. And the particular type of trial, and first of all, a trial is when you do an experiment. So if you remember from chapter two, we talked about experiments and observational studies. We discussed that a trial is how often, how many times you do the experiment. So if you do the experiment once, then that's one trial. So in a, in a probability experiment, same idea, okay? Now a Bernoulli trial is a, is a special name given by the name uh, the mathematician, statistician that uh, did a lot of uh, research in this area, uh, is a trial that only has two outcomes. So any trial where, the, where there's only two possible outcomes is called a Bernoulli trial. Okay? So now, that's actually one of the conditions for a binomial distribution that we're going to talk about. So here's a couple of things that we're going to discuss. Okay, so for, for a binomial random variable, oops, um, where's my marker? Oh, here we go. Let me use this one. Okay, so for a binomial um, distribution, here are the conditions that need to be met in order for a random variable to be considered a binomial random variable or an experiment to be considered a binomial experiment. Um, and I'm going to write these down. They're, and, and the order really doesn't matter. Um, so here's the thing. Um, here, the first one, the first condition, is that there has to be a fixed number of trials, okay? And that's where n comes from. So there's only going to be n trials. Right? So basically the sample size. How big is your sample size? You're only going to have a fixed sample size um, in this experiment. Okay? So you just don't keep running the experiment over and over again forever. Right? Now, you're only interested in a fixed number of trials or a fixed sample size. So it says there are a fixed number of trials. You'll think of the trials as repetitions of the experiment. So n denotes the number of trials. So that's one condition. Two, there are only two possible outcomes. So remember, Bernoulli. So only two possible outcomes for each trial. So So either a success or a failure, whatever you, however you, those are defined, okay? Now, the third condition is that the n trials in the experiment are independent of each other. So the outcome of one trial has no effect on the probability of the next trial or any of the other trials uh, as far as being a success or a failure. Okay, so no effect on the outcome. So trials 
are independent. And fourth, the probability of a success on any given trial. Okay, so think of each of the end trials. Well, however you define, however you define a success, the probability of a success on each trial is the same. It's fixed, constant. Okay. Now, we denote the probability of a success on one trial as P. That's how we denote. So P is the probability of success on one trial. So it's fixed for all n trials, so it doesn't change. Now, in order to be a binomial distribution, it must satisfy the, these four criteria. In addition to, the random variable must be defined a specific way. And in this case here, the random variable that we're interested in is going to be the number of successes out of the n trials. Okay? So there's your quote unquote fit condition. Okay? Now, if you have a binomial, excuse me, if you have a probability experiment and that probability experiment satisfies these four conditions and the random variable is defined this way, you have a binomial experiment and in other words, a binomial random variable. Now, what happens if it does satisfy all these conditions? Well, lots of good things happen, okay? So, let's take an example. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's take this example. So, now, We have randomly guessing on a multiple choice, choice question with four possible answers has only two outcomes. If a success is guessing correctly, then a failure is going to be guessing incorrectly, right? You're either going to get the problem wrong, wrong or you're going to get it right, right? So only one out of the four questions will be the correct answer, or one out of the four options will be the correct answer, right? So, suppose there are six multiple choice questions. Joe guesses on each question with no pattern. Determine if this is a binomial experiment. Well, let's, let's go through those check marks, right? Um, so one, are there a fixed number of trials in this experiment? And the answer is yes, because each question is considered a trial, right? He's going to guess on each question. So each question is a repetition of the experiment, right? So he's going to guess on the next first one, then the next one. So each question is considered a trial. So how many trials are there in this experiment? Six, because there are six questions. So there's a fixed number of trials. So condition number one is met. Number two. Um, how many outcomes are there on each question? We covered that one, right? So either you're going to get the question right or you're going to get the question wrong. So there's only two possible answers for each question or possible outcomes for each question, right? You're either going to get it right or wrong. Okay, so that condition is bad. The third condition, are the trials independently, independent of each other? Well, let's think about that. 
If I'm guessing at random, right, with no discernible pattern, I'm just guessing on each question. Joe is guessing on each question. If I get the first question correct, will the fact that I get the first question correct affect the probability of getting the next question correct if I'm just guessing at random? Well, the answer is no. Well, in fact, will it affect any of the questions? Well, no. So these questions, these trials, are independent of each other. So that's a check mark. So now the last condition, um, what is the probability of success for each question? Well, we're dealing with a multiple choice question, right? There are four possible answers for each question, but only one answer is correct, right? So that means we have a probability of what? One out of four for each question. So the probability of getting each question correct is the same, which means P is fixed, right? So in that case, what is P? Well, P is the probability of getting it correct, right? Because we, we're defining a success as answering the question correctly. So P, oops. So in this case, P is the probability of getting the question correct. Which is going to be equal to what? Point two five, right? And that's going to be the same for all the questions. Okay? Now, any questions on that? So this is a binomial experiment. Okay. Oh, oh, one last thing. What about the random variable, x? Well, what are we interested in counting? Well, um, If we're interested in counting the number of correct questions, right, that's why P, P is the probability of success. What is the success? Answering correctly. What are we interested in? In the number of questions correct out of what? Six. And we're done. So it is a binomial experiment. Okay, so any questions about that? That should be pretty clear, right? So as long as it satisfies those conditions, it's a binomial experiment and follow the random variable x follows a binomial distribution. Now, here's some of the notation that you need to know for a binomial distribution. Okay, some of them we've already gone over. But realize that if, if an experiment fits a binomial experiment, then x is binomial. So x is denoted this way. So the tilde in statistics in this manner represents a distribution. So what we're seeing is x, the random variable x, has a distribution that's binomial. So we use capital B. And then in parentheses, we put the parameters, right? Remember the parameters? So the parameters of a distribution are the parameters that we need to know to dis completely describe the distribution. In fact, it's everything we need to know to calculate probabilities, um, uh, the mean, the standard deviation, the variance. Okay. So in this case here, what are the two parameters? Well, we've already been given them, right? What do we need to know about a binomial distribution? We need to know what? How many trials there are. N, and what? The probability of a success. So N and P. Okay? So now, so here are some of the notations here. So here's the how you describe the distribution. This is the correct notation. P is the probability of success. Q, 
which is equal to the probability of failure, right? Okay, now notice that in a binomial experiment, because it deals with Bernoulli trials, right, there's only two possible outcomes, right, either a success or a failure. So the probability of success plus the probability of failure should always add up to what? One. So what does this mean? P plus Q equals one, or Q is equal to P, oh, excuse me, 1 minus p, okay? So q is always equal to 1 minus p. So I will use q a lot instead of 1 minus p. The textbook, certain textbooks will use 1 minus p. Um, just realize that q is the same as 1 minus p, okay? So those are the notations for p and q. n is the number of trials. So remember, n is the number of trials. Okay, and x is counting the number of successes out of n trials. Okay, so now let's do some examples. Okay, now, so now the last example we saw that it was a binomial experiment. Let's see here, so let's look at this one. Now it says, in this example here, it says randomly guessing on a multiple choice question has has only two outcomes. Um, let's take this example. It says, if a success is guessing correctly, then a failure is guessing incorrectly. Suppose there are six multiple choice questions. The first three questions have four choices, and the last three questions have five choices each. Joe guesses on each question with no pattern. Determine if this is a binomial experiment. So now, what is the only difference in this example for Joe versus the other example? Yes, the questions don't have the same number of possible answers. The first three questions have four possible answers, right? where which one is only one out of the four is correct. The last three questions have five possible answers where only one of the five is the correct answer. So what happens to the probability of a success? It changes, right? For the first three questions, the probability of getting it correctly by guessing is one out of four. What's the probability of success on the last three questions in this example? It's one out of five. So does the probability of a success change or stay the same? It changes. So therefore, this cannot be a binomial experiment because P is no longer the same for each question. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Okay, so now, let's do this. So now, let's say that 65% of people pass the state driver's exam on the first try. Boy, oh boy, 65% of the people pass the state driver's test the first time. Okay. A group of 50 individuals who have taken this driver's exam is randomly selected. Okay, so these are people who took the driver's exam we randomly selected, we don't know if they passed or not, right? We just randomly selected them. Give two reasons why this is a binomial problem. 
Well, think of it this way. We can go through all four of the, um, the conditions, right? So one, is there a fixed number of trials? Yes, we only have 50 people, right? 50 selected drivers, right? For selected people that took the driver's exam, right? So there's a fixed number of trials. Each person is a trial, right? Either they, they, they all took the test, right? The result of that test is a trial, right? So we have n is equal to 50 in this case. Are there only two possible outcomes for each trial? Yes, each driver's test is going to either result in a pass or fail, right? Either you pass the driver's test or you don't, okay? So there's the Bernoulli trials, right? There's only two possible outcomes. Um, are they independent? Well, in this case, yes, we can assume that they're independent because why? We randomly selected the 50 people, right? So if we're randomly selecting, then the probability of one person passing or failing shouldn't be affected by the fact that another person passed or failed, right? Completely independent of each other, okay? So now, the last one, the probability of passing. Well, that's where the first sentence comes in. It says, we know that 65% of people pass the state driver's exam on the first try. That's your probability of success. So that's P. So P is 0.65. And since we're doing a random sample, we can assume that the probability of each individually chosen person passing is the same, 0.65. And so yes, this is a binomial experiment, provided that what we're going to want to be interested in is the number of people who pass out of the 50. That's our random variable. So yes, this is a binomial experiment. We can use this as a, with a binomial distribution. Okay. So now, what if I want to calculate a probability? Well, here's the formula for calculating a probability for a binomial experiment. So if I want the probability that x is equal to some value x, this is the formula. Okay. This is the formula for, for, uh, for calculating the probability of being equal to. Okay. So it's the number of ways, the number of combinations of choosing x successes or having x successes out of n trials times the probability of success raised to the power of the number of successes x times the probability of failure raised to the power of the number of failures. That's where the n minus x comes from. Because if you have x successes, then the rest have to be failures, or n minus x, right? Okay, so this is how you calculate probabilities using this formula. Okay, now, what about the mean, variance, and standard deviation? Well, to calculate mu is easy. It's just n times p, okay? And to calculate variance, it's just n times p times q. And of course, the standard deviation is just going to be the square root of that. So it's the square root of n p q. And that's it. That's how easy it is. Once you know that it's a binomial experiment, this is all you need to calculate probabilities. Okay? And I'm also going to show you the calculator. Okay? So we can use, so again, uh, for calculating probabilities like this, like x is less than or equal to x, or the probability that x is less than some value x, or the probability that x is greater than or equal to some value x, and so on. Each one of those is just about applying the same formula over and over again 
and then adding up the individual probabilities. Okay, and I'm going to do an example, but after I do an example, I'll show you how to do the same thing using the calculator, and it becomes very easy. Okay, so let's do an example. Uh, let's see here. Let's do... Um, Okay, so let's take the example that we did for the, uh, where Joe guesses on the multiple choice problems, okay? So we already saw that as long as the multiple choice questions are the same with the same number of uh, questions or the same number of possible answers, we're fine, okay? So now let's take that example. So in that example, X represents the number of correct questions out of six, right? Um, so in this case, n is equal to six. P, the probability of success, well, we already talked about that. It was 0.25, right? One out of four. And then Q, obviously, is what? Well, Q is 1 minus P, right, using the complement rule. And so it's going to be 0 0.75, right? So 0 0.75 plus 0.25 adds up to 1, OK? So now, here's the table that we have. So let's figure out. Um, the probability distribution function, right? We could do that. So let's create our table. And then, oh, 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 oh. I forgot zero. We can get, we can always get zero, right? We can get none of the questions correct. Okay, so here are the possible values for x. And now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the probability of each one of these using the binomial formula. Okay, now, the binomial formula, remember, is going to be p, oh, let me do it this way. So p of x equal to x is going to be n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to use that formula to calculate each one of the probabilities, okay? So this is how it works. So I'm going to do the probability that x equals 1, or excuse me, 0. So I'm just going to plug into that, right? So here's the thing. I'm going to do how many? What's n? n is 6. So it's going to be 6, choose how many? x, whatever my x value is. In this case, it's 0, right? So I'm doing 0 first. So it's going to be 6, choose x, times p. Well, how many successes am I looking at? x. How many is x? 0. So it's going to be p to the 0 power times q. Well, if there are 0 successes, how many failures do I have? All of them, right? So 6. So notice something there. Notice how 
These two add up to n, write 6 and 0, and also the exponents, the number of successes and the number of failures always should add up to n, in this case, 6. So now, all I have to do is plug and chug, right? So how many ways can I choose 0 out of 6? 1. There's only one way, remember? So this is just 1. What's p to the 0 power? Well, any number raised to the 0 power is 1. And then what do I have left over? I have q to the 6. Well, then that's 0.75 to the 6th power. Excuse me. And so what's the probability that, all of, that, I, that um, Joe misses all of them? Well, it's going to be 0.178. Okay, so that's 0.178. So now I'm going to do the same thing for x equal to 1, right? So now all I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, right? And I'm just going to change this to 1. And so if I do that, now it's going to be n choose 1. So it's going to be 6 choose 1 times p to the 1 power times q to the, well now, if there's one success out of 6, how many failures are there? 5. So now it's going to be q to the 5. Now. This is going to equal what 6 choose 1? That's going to be 6 times p to the 1 power. So what's p? p is 0.25. So that's 0.25 to the first power times q, which is 0.75 to the fifth power. Now, all I have to do is multiply that together using my calculator. So I get 6 times 0.25 times 0.75 raised to the fifth power, and I get 0.356. So 0.356 goes here. And so again, I'm going to do the same thing. Now, all I have to do is change this to a 2. Right? And then all, now it's just going to become 6 choose 2, right? Times p to what power? 2. Times q to what power? Now it's 4, right? And then what do I get when I do that? I get 0.297. And so if I fill in the rest of the table, what you'll get is you get 0 0.132, 0 0.033, 0 0.00439, 0 0.00 and the last one is 0 0.00024. Now, notice what happens with these probabilities. Okay, add all these probabilities up. Now, they're obviously between 0 and 1. And uh, let's see what happens when we add these up. 0.7178 plus 356 plus 297 plus 132 plus 033 plus 00439 plus 00024. And what do we get? We get 1.00063. Close enough. So this is a valid probability distribution. Okay. Obviously, it's not going to be exact because we have round off error. So close enough. Okay. So now this is a probability distribution. Now we can answer questions about probability. Now, what is the probability? Now, what's the probability of x equal to 3? 0.132. 
What's the probability of x being equal to 2? 0.297. What if though, what if I want, what if I want this then? What's the probability of x being less than or equal to 3? Well, what's, what does less than or equal to 3 mean? Less than or equal to 3 means 3 or less. So 3 or less, which means this is equal to the probability that x equals 3 or what? 2 or 1 or 0. Well, what does this mean? This means these are all mutually exclusive, right? So that means this is the probability that x equals 3 plus the probability that x equals 2 plus the probability that x equals 1 plus the probability that x equals 0. And so what do we do? All we have to do is take each of these probabilities and add them up. So what's the probability of being at least, th uh, at, at most, uh, or less than or equal to 3? Well, it's going to be 0.178 plus 0.356 plus 0.297 plus 0.132. And so what's the probability? 0.963. Okay. Well, what if, what if I do this? What if I say the probability of less than 3? Well, that means I'm no longer including 3, right? So I can't include that. So I can't add this piece. So which means... I'm going to subtract off 1, 3, 2. Okay? So again, I, depending on how it's written, right? Or what, how it's phrased in the problem. Now, what if I say this? What if I say, what's the probability of at least one? Right? What's the probability of him getting at least one question correct? Well, in this case here, I would add this one, right? At least one means what? One or more. So one or more. So one or two or three or four or five. So I would add up all of these probabilities, right? Well, is there another way of doing this? Yes, because what's the complement to at least one? None, right? The probability of none, getting none of them right. Well, I could just take 1 minus this probability and get the same thing, right? Using the complement rule, right? So, now, you don't have to write out the probability distribution table every time you look at a problem. Uh, because all you have to do is apply the formula each time, right? So, if I didn't have this, right? And I wanted to know, hey, what's the probability that x is um, at least 1, right? Well, in this case here, I would just use the complement rule, right? Because it's just equal to 1 minus the probability of none, right? Which is equal to the probability of x is equal to what? 0. Well, now I can just use the formula here, right? 1 minus what? 6 choose 0 times p to the 0 times q to the 6, right? And then I can just plug this into my formula, right? So this is just going to be 1 times 1, right, because this is 1, this is 1, and then times what? 0.75 to the 6th or 6th uh, power, right? Well, what do I get? I get 1 minus 0.179, right? Or 178. 
So I did point 1 minus point 0.178, right? So what's the probability of at least one? Well, it's going to be point 0.822, two. right? Okay, does that make sense? I hope that helps. Okay, so now, um, how do I do this using the calculator? Okay, here's how I would do the same thing using the calculator, right? So let's take this example, and now this is going to be practiced using the calculator, okay? There are two functions on your calculator you're going to use for a binomial distribution, okay? Both of these functions are used to get probability, okay? But they, they get different probabilities, okay, depending on what the question is, okay? So, the probabilities, um, the two functions is binome PDF, right? And the second one is binome CDF. Now, both of these functions, you have to remember what to put into the calculator. Okay? There's only three arguments that you need to put into the calculator. The first two are the parameters. The last one is your x, the number of successes that they give you or that you're interested in. So it's always going to be n, comma, p, comma, x for both of them. Okay? The number of trials, the probability of a success, and the number of successes. Okay? So now, what does the binomial PDF question give or function give you? Well, this is the probability it gives you. It gives you the probability of being equal to. That's it. So if you want the probability of x being equal to 1, or the probability of x being equal to 0, or the probability of x being equal to 5, or 10, or 11, then you're going to use the binomial PDF function on your calculator. The binomial CDF function, now CDF, now we know what this stands for, probability distribution function. The CDF, so CDF here stands for cumulative distribution. function. So I want you to remember cumulative, okay? Remember what cumulative stands means from our talk in chapter 2, okay? So now, cumulative or distribution function or CDF means that the calculator is going to give you the probability of x being less than or equal to x. So if you want the probability of being less than or equal to or the probability of being less than, or the probability of being greater than, or the probability of being greater than or equal to, chances are you're going to use the binome CDF somewhere in your calculation. Okay? And again, we're going to do an example, a couple examples to show you this. Okay? But remember, the calculator only gives you the probability of being less than or equal to. So whatever you put in there, that's what the calculator is going to spit out, okay? So make sure you're putting in the right information, okay? PDF is pretty easy. There's only one answer, only one question it will answer, equal to, okay? The CDF function you can use for all the other questions that we're going to talk about, okay? So again, these are just for calculating probabilities under the condition that it's a binomial random variable or a binomial experiment. Okay. So now let's fill in the table using the functions. Okay. So if we have our table again, okay. So again, if we have our table of values, Okay, so now, 
How would we fill in this table? Very easy. Well, we know what n is, we know what p is, and we know what our x values are. So here, all we would do is put into our calculator, all we would do is go to binome PDF, right? Because we want equal to, right? PDF, 6, comma, 0.25, comma, 0. Because that's what x is, right? Now, how do you get to your binome CDF and PDF function? This is where you need to go. On your calculator, you're going to need to find your distribution menu. Where you find your distribution menu is easy. If you go under second bars, so your bars key, right, and you hit second. So hit second bars, that will give you the distribution menu. Okay. Once you're at the bars of your distribution menu, you're going to scroll down until you find binome PDF, binome CDF. And I believe, if I remember correctly, this is A. And this one is B. They're one right after the other. Okay? So all you have to do is go to second bars, and then it'll bring you to your distribution menu, and all you have to do is scroll down until you find your binome, PDF, and CDF function. And then just hit enter. Okay? And then all you're gonna do is when you hit enter, just stick in your N, your P, and your X. So now for the next one, all I would do is binome. PDF, 6, comma, 0.25, comma, 1. And then for the next one, binome, PDF, 6, comma, 0.25, comma, 2. And then so on and so forth. And you'll get the exact same answer. Okay? Now, what about the questions I had? Okay? So let's take that into consideration. Um, so now, let's say we have this table filled out, and again, we don't need the table, but again, if you wanted to fill out the table, that's all you would do, okay? But you don't need the table, right? So if I wanted to answer these questions, so let's say A, is I want the probability that he guesses three questions right. So what's the probability that X equals three, okay? B, let's say I want the probability that X uh, is greater than um, 4. Let's say that I want to know what the probability that he guesses more than 4 questions right. Um, what about C? Let's say the probability that he gets um, less than or equal to two questions right. Okay. And then the final one, let's do this one. Let's say, what's the probability that he gets between um, two and three questions, uh, two and four? Or this one. Let's do this. He gets between two and four. Okay? Um, well, that's the same as three. You know what? Let's just keep it that way, just, just for this, just, just to keep this, uh, just for the sake of doing it. Uh, you know what? Let's do five. Let's do five. Okay, let's do that. Um, so now, to do this one here, Again, we already did this one. This would just be which function? Well, since it's equal to, it would be the PDF function. So this one, we would just use binome PDF. And then we would put in N, which is 6. And then P, which is 0.25. And then the last thing is X, which comes from right here. So that's 3. And if we use the binome 
So let's just use your calculator. So second, so we'll quit out of this. And let's go to second vars and scroll down to binome PDF. And then I'm going to put in 6, comma, 0.25, comma, 3. And we get point, uh, 0.132, which is what we got before, right? 0.132. OK. So does that make sense? I hope so. So now, let's do this one. What about this one? x is greater than 4. OK. Well, does this fit either of the forms that we're looking for, right? Does it? No. Doesn't fit equals, and it definitely doesn't look like uh, less than or equal to. So what we're going to need to do is we need to put this in a form that we can use. Okay. Whenever we have greater than or greater than or equal to, and we're using the calculator here, we're going to use the complement rule. Okay. So in other words, we're always going to write this one, whether it's equal, greater than or greater than or equal to, we're going to use the complement rule. Okay, we're always going to write it that way. Okay, we're going to have one minus the probability of x being less than or equal to some value. Okay, we just got to remember what value goes in there. So now the thing is, is we have to ask ourselves: we're using the complement rule. So remember, we're splitting the um, the sample space into two pieces, right? So this is one set, right? This set is greater than 4, right? So that means it's going to be what outcomes? Everything that's greater than 4. That means 5 and 6. Well, what's the complement to that then? Well, that would mean the complement would be everything that's less than that, right? So that would include 4, 3, 2, and 1, and 0, right? So that means x, the complement of this, is going to be that x is less than or equal to what? 4. So here's the thing. 4 is not included in this set over here because it's greater than. If 4 is not included here, excuse me, if 4 is not included in this set, 